Thank you for taking time out of your hectic schedule to come to this press conference. I understand you have a lot of questions for members uh, outside the chamber. But of course, in this room, we're just looking at the um, audit report number 64, or rather the public accounts committee report number 64. Now, the audit report uh, covers eight chapters. And out of the eight chapters, we selected three for conducting hearings. First one, buildings, departments, actions on unauthorized building works. Here, our deputy chairman, Mr. Porter, uh, was the lead member in this case. Uh, he will be uh, briefing you in a moment. And then the second chapter that we chose for public hearing was uh, the operation of the government flying service. And Mr. M. Leung Singh was the lead member in the hearing. The third chapter was public cooked food markets managed by the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department. The lead member was Mr. Alan Leung. Perhaps for each report, or perhaps we could take one report, uh, one chapter at a time. Otherwise, if we take three chapters together, it may be a bit confusing. Now, can I ask the Deputy Chairman to briefly take you through the uh, re our report on this chapter and uh, what our comments are, and then afterwards it will be Mr. Mleung Singh and then Mr. Alan Leung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On uh, unauthorized building works, uh, before 1975, there was not a policy on UBWs. The policy only started uh, after 1975, but then at that time, there was no definition on uh, what a UBWs needed to be acted upon at once, and, and then the problem uh, accrued. And then in um, April 2011, there was a new policy. Uh, what were not actionable UBWs became uh, in, now, um, UB, actionable UBWs because of seven more categories were added to the list of actionable UBWs, even when there's no imminent danger or environmental nuisance. So this was a shift in the policy in 2011. And actually, that's... Uh, one of the main reasons why the problems become um, even bigger now. At the time, there was no consideration as to whether there were enough manpower to deal with the um, expanded scope of UBWs and no uh, sufficient resources were given to the department to handle these cases. That's why the problem kept accruing. And uh, for our conclusion, we would like the administration to provide sufficient resources to the relevant authorities to um, deal with the UBWs. And if they could not um, deploy enough resources at once, they should at least review the policy to see whether there's a need to change it. So there is no need to keep in expanding a list of um, outstanding UBW clearance. Now, because um, in the past 10 years, the government spent some $2.9 billion on dealing with UBWs. But then with the expanded scope, uh, there are now more reports of UBWs, but when it comes to the clearance of UBWs, uh, the percentage has gone down and efficiency has gone down. So that's definitely not value for money. And that's why we would like the administration to review the policy as soon as possible and consider whether there is need to redefine the scope of actionable UBWs. Perhaps I will leave time to other members. Uh, on you know the law enforcement problems, uh, um, the undesirable situation involving clearance and so on. We allow 15 minutes for questions, and then we'll go to Mr. Nlung Singh's chapter. Questions first, perhaps on this chapter. Yes, TVB. You comment on. You said that 
the number of cases there was more complaints and then there was a drop still in the handling and removal of these UBWs. And you also noted that a lot of funding was given to these departments. So what exactly happened? What was the dis discrepancy in terms of all this funding being given, but how come there was no action coming out of it? I mean, I know there's more okay. cases, but at the same time, okay. how uh, is the money well, I, I value think, from uh, it? Just now, um, uh, the Honourable Porter actually gave a summary, just to give a brief rundown, that it, in the 10 years between 01 to 15, uh, more than 10 years, so 01 to 15, that government, as uh, the Honourable Porter said, they have actually rendered about $2.9 billion. In, for instance, in 2001 to 2002, there, the reported case were 23,947 yearly. But in the year of uh, 2014-2015, the reported case went up to 42,127. means that there was a growth of over 70%. In the removal of the unauthorized building works, there were, oh, there, and in 2001, there was 23,000 per year, approximately. And, but, no, there were 40,000 40, per year, 40,000 uh, cases per year. But when it come down to one five, the, the cases went down by 17,000. So you can see, actually, the inefficiency um, that despite money being given, but then, of course, uh, the Honourable Jay also was pointed out that in April 2011, we have actually a new policy which embraces that um, the um, seven actionable uh, unauthorized building works covered all areas. So I'll let uh, Paul to give you a further answer, Paul. Well, I think uh, uh, uh told you the figures about the, uh, the, uh, the increase in funding. Uh, the number of increase um, in terms of the, uh, the reports that were made to the authorities and the numbers that uh, the cases are handled by the authorities. So I, I don't think I have anything to add on that basis, unless you have anything further to... F yeah. yes. So in terms of the inefficiency, what do you think needs to be done to make the department more efficient when it comes to handling these things? You mentioned amending the policy. Right. How would you amend the policy to make it more value for money in terms of unauthorized building works? Well, for instance, um, the, the, air, the scope of the, uh, uh, the so-called um, UB, UBWs may have to be redefined to make sure that uh, we're not covering too much or excessively uh, those that we cannot actually uh, deal with uh, effectively and efficiently within a reasonable time. And I think that that actually uh, sprang from what happened in 2012 when we uh, vastly expanded the scope of the uh, definition of UBWs but at the same time, we haven't allocated sufficient resources to deal with them. And we underestimated the difficulties of dealing with such UBWs. So I think that was a major reason why the efficiency dropped so rapidly and so um, evidently. Okay. Thank you. RTHK here. Maybe, Mr. Chair, you can answer this one as well. Um, uh, given the criticism you have of the buildings department for their failures, uh, is giving them more money really going to solve the problem? Do you have confidence that with more resources they'll be able to tackle the issue? Or do you think a more comprehensive review of the policy is actually is what's needed? I've actually mentioned both solutions. One is obviously to give them more money. Uh, not just give them the money, but, the, but also the, uh, the, the system. We have to improve the system as to how they tackle the um, dealing with the reports as to how they d uh, deal with the question of uh, sending out summonses, issuing summonses for those who are not complying with the uh, notices, and also the re removal orders as well. A lot of things that we have to improve uh, along the line. But uh, more importantly, we have to allocate sufficient resources, both in terms of money and uh, human resources for them. And at the same time, like I mentioned earlier, we have to uh, comprehensively review the, uh, the policy as to uh, how we should define uh, the uh, sort of uh, UBWs uh, as to uh, those that are actionable or uh, those with immediate danger that we have to tackle right away, as opposed to those that we can wait. And we also suggest uh, during the uh, hearing that uh, perhaps we can consider other options as well, such as issuing uh, fixed penalty summonses instead of having to uh, deal with the uh, sort of prosecution uh, uh, as, as, as an alternative. But also the question of whether we should um, uh, give more exemptions when, when necessary, where reasonable. Uh, those are the options that we should consider. Okay, thank you, man. Okay. 
I have two questions. I identify yourself at Commercial Radio. The first question. We see that in the report, um, the um, policy was changed in 2011, and the scope has been expanded. And then the removal, uh, the number of removal uh, handled from 2011 to 14 has dropped by over 50 percent. How come that this is the case? Uh, should somebody be held responsible for, for example, the director of uh, building or the development uh, secretary? And on page 49. Uh, you said that the authorities have been not been very proactive in implementing uh, removal orders. But then for uh, people, uh, public figures having UBWs, you are dealing with these cases m more swiftly. Um, so why is that the case? One of the figures involved is uh, CY Lang. There are a total of 60,000 outstanding removal orders and only 15,000 removal orders have been outstanding for six, over six years. And this is a major problem. I'll defer to Mr. Porter to take your other question. I, I think the report has all the figures. I, I won't repeat them here. The crust of the problem is this. Uh, we have expanded the scope of actionable UBWs, but at the same time, we are not providing the corresponding resources to deal with the increase. So if the scope has been expanded, of course, there will be more public reports. So the number on that side has increased substantially, but then our ability to cope has not been catching up with the increased uh, uh, re number of reports. So that's why we have a greater backlog of um, uh, cases. Now, as to whether it is fair, now, we know that uh, Mr. Henry Tang has a UBW. We have uh, taken action against it. The government has not given us a satisfactory reply. They said that they were uh, concerned because um, the media and the public were very concerned about the issue, so they had to act swiftly. But then, in accordance with the prosecution policies, they have to meet with a number of tests. Um, but in that particular case, they had not been abiding the, with the prescribed prosecution criteria or screening criteria. The buildings department had a policy and that there were three criteria to be met before the enforcement actions were taken. And in that particular case, these three criteria were not met. As what Mr. Porcher explained, we weren't given a satisfactory reply. And they said that, well, they had dealt with the case only. So any other member wishing to answer that question to Ellen? Chairman? We have been uh, made things very clear in the report. On these UBWs, the government's policy was, is, has all along been very stringent. But then, they've not been, well, they've been too ambitious. In 2011, they have expanded the scope or the number of UBWs to be dealt with. But in terms of resources, manpower, there weren't enough, uh, there wasn't enough support. So th that's what we meant by they being too ambitious. So they had, as a result, they had not been um, acting fairly or enforcing the law uh, fairly. Now, for law-abiding citizens, when they uh, receive the removal order, then they would act uh, swiftly to uh, clear them. But then the neighbor may be having the UBWs, say, for 80 years, and they still uh, went unchecked. So the PAC uh, said to the development secretary, and uh, ask him to increase the manpower and resources so that um, they are not just paying lip service to the policies and they're actually uh, taking actions. However, the conclusions we draw shows that uh, uh, reports are made by members of the public. Uh, the removal orders are, are, are really imposed too late and even 
if the removal orders are issued, nobody was there to uh, follow up. And then if an encumbrance on the land title has to be added, then there is nobody to follow up on that, that as well. And if prosecution cases ha has to be done, the files have not been passed on to the uh, D of J, and no follow-up action was taken either. So that's a problem with them being aiming too high and being too ambitious. The Mr. Uh, Mr. Paul Chan said that he would not rule out that uh, at an appropriate time the authorities will uh, review the relevant policies and that they would not be just paying lip service to their policies and that there would not be any enforcement action. And by the way they are doing it now, people will find that the enforcement is being unfair. Oriental Daily, Lung Kapo. In your report, it is said that the government has uh, allocated additional funding to the buildings department to deal with UBW uh, issues. But after 2011, the new policy was implemented. The numbers have dropped instead. I would like to know why is that the case? Is it because that the scope has been expanded and then uh, a lot of resources have been earmarked for such uh, to deal with such reports and then you ha are left with too little resources to do prosecution. And also the uh, PAC has um, advocated whether there should be amnesty granted and also whether a fixed penalty system should be implemented. Well, would that give the public the impression that you will be treating such illegal acts light to light lead? Also, the Director of Building and the Secretary for Development, do they have to be held responsible for the lowering number of um, UBWs dealt with? and then in 2011, the policy was changed suddenly, as Mr. Portier pointed out. And before before 2011 April, they would only act on UBWs that posed danger or envi uh, environmental uh, hygiene nuisance. But then uh, from April 2011 for all UBWs, they became actionable. So the workload was substantially increased. And there were more reports uh, made to the buildings department. Still, they tried the best with the manpower they had. So in our report, we try to lay bare the facts. Uh, it's not about just uh, holding anyone accountable, but rather our report is forward-looking in nature. We hope that they will increase their manpower and resources. Now, if you have a policy and you try to meet the policy objectives, you can't, you have to find out why. Maybe it's because to do manpower or resources. And then um, perhaps the policy itself is not right. Maybe it's too ambitious. It's too extensive, as Mr. Leung pointed out. So I think his answer to the question as to who should be held accountable, in our report, we just want to uh, state all the facts. Now, they have to shoulder the responsibility, but as I said, it's all about being forward-looking. That is how they could do their job better and address the problems they face. Mr. Wang Yong-man, now on the way the hand buildings department handled the UBWs, 
in the report, you can see clearly what they have done. Of course, we're not happy. We're disappointed from the point of value for money. After April 2011, all UBWs were covered. But uh, even before April 2011, they weren't able to cope with uh, actionable UBWs then. And then they had a new policy, but then they didn't give any new resources. Of course, it's not going to work. You know, um, with education, it takes over 100 years to educate a generation. And even with uh, removal of UBWs, I think it takes more than 100 years. So if you ask me, of course, I'm very unhappy with the way the building department handled UBWs over the years. And then um, some reporters asked that there's a, a differential treatment against um, uh, the well-known figures. But we see that. They just targeted Henry Tang, but not uh, Siwa Long. That's what I say. This is what I'm saying. Now, on the conclusions. How come the Development Bureau, uh, you know, or, or on the Development Bureau's role, you just say that there are not enough resources? How come you don't mention their responsibility and their the way they govern, uh, the, the governors? Because last time for, um, the Transport and Housing Bureau was uh, condemned severely. How come this time there's no need to condemn the Development Bureau? Now you say perhaps we could uh, give exemption to the not, da not so dangerous UBWs. Maybe then you give the public the impression that even if something's not right, as long as it doesn't pose danger, there's no need to deal with it. Now whenever we write a report, uh, we would discuss it. We try to look at the matter from a fair and impartial angle. So every report is different. Now we look at the role and the uh, powers of the Development Bureau, how it allocates resources and how it monitors the work of the Buildings Department. The power actually rests with the Director of Buildings. And when it comes to resources allocation, of course, that's for the Development Bureau to manage. Uh, it's also is supposed to monitor the performance of the Buildings Department. Actually, we've expressed regret against the Development Bureau, but, then, uh, but the policy, of course, comes from the Development Bureau. So maybe there's not enough communication between the Bureau and the Department, and perhaps um, they didn't um, consider the actual situation carefully. How come they um, proposed this um, new policy in April 2011? So, did uh, they have a full picture of the, of the actual situation? Because there are so many different types of UBWs. Some are really minor in nature, and uh, they don't pose any danger. In 2011, all such UBWs were included as uh, together with the dangerous UBWs. But it can't be because UBWs could be graded um, uh, by the degree of um, danger. Because if some UBWs may not pose any danger, they don't affect the public uh, or they don't have, have cause any um, hygiene nuisance, maybe then we could educate people what they should do instead. Uh, Mr. Chair. Now, in uh, in 2011, they changed the definition, so a lot more UBWs needed to be dealt with. At the time, there was also the stock taking exercise. They covered 870,000 UBWs, some 96 percent. That means uh, over 1.79 million cases could be dealt with by the men, minor works validation scheme. Uh, uh, they could go through validation. And then there are another 120,000 uh, UBWs which could be validated under the sign boards uh, uh, validation scheme. But then the, the, the response rate was low. Why? One of the reasons what had to do with um, enforcement, because over a long time there's not been any effective um, um, enforcement. Um, either no removal orders were issued or removal orders were not followed up on and so on. But still, actually by law, the government could actually remove the UBWs and then uh, uh, pursue reimbursement from the owners. But then the government did not do that. That's why there's such a backlog of cases and outstanding removal orders. Now, I'm in support of an exemption arrangement because it's like um, when, uh, in the 60s when we dealt with uh, massive corruption. 
um, for historical reasons, we couldn't address the problem in one go. So uh, it's the same here for the um, not dangerous UBWs, uh, which didn't do pose any problem. We could exempt them, and then we could address the unfairness issue, and we could uh, deal with uh, these problems. Because right now the law says, uh, even if it's a minor UBW, as long as you have not um, made an application, you've not submitted the plans. Uh, um, you, it's considered UBWs, and you could, uh, you, you may be asked to remove the UBWs, and then you submit a plan. It will be approved, and you're building the same building works again. So that's a waste of resources. So for minor UBWs, mm, there is actually room to consider exemption. Well, um, uh, Mr. Gary Chen, well, you know, for the UBWs. Apart from the major ones and those of imminent danger, as uh, Mr. Portier pointed out, for the large majority of UBWs, they are actually small-scale household building works, maybe uh, like um, um, drying, clothes drying rack or um, air conditioner rack. Now, in the 2011 stock taking exercise, some 1.8 million UBWs were identified. And then under the uh, existing schemes of um, the buildings department, there could be a straightforward validation. And then there's no need to make the UBW st figure stand at such a, a high number. So it's about good publicity by the buildings build department. And then we don't need to have um, such a large number of UBWs. If you refer to page 51 of the report, you'll see that from 2011 to 14, under the validation scheme, only 1,300 um, uh, works cases were validated compared to the 1.79 million cases. So that's a small number. So even uh, uh, with the B buildings department's own validation schemes, uh, the department has not done enough publicity, and um, uh, indirectly, that's led to a soar in the number of UBW cases. Okay, last question on this re uh, report, and then we move on to the next one. After 2011, is there a breakdown of the 2.9 billion dollars? Uh, how? Much was allocated uh, between 2011 and 2014 for enforcement actions by the uh, building department because uh, uh, the figure covered uh, the period from 2001 to 2014, uh, 15 is their breakdown. And then you said perhaps um, the, um, the government could reconsider, reconsider the definition and redefine these problems. Now, if you redefine the problem, uh, are you concerned that people uh, might criticize you for moving the goalpost? Now, this is a massive problem, and so you're just trying to limit the scope so the problem becomes smaller, and, and could uh, people may accuse you of uh, window dressing. Well, when a problem is there, it has to be addressed. But it takes time, resources, and capability to address problems. Problems could be large ones, small ones, or 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 in between. Now, for um, UBWs before. A, uh, before April 2011, some of the UBWs were not considered a problem. They were not included in the actionable list. Uh, th they might not uh, attract removal orders. Now all these were caught since April 2011. So we just want to take a snapshot uh, at the timeline of April 2011. We should uh, review the problem. Maybe instead of uh, using the current policy to deal with these problems, could there be other means to deal with them? Because uh, we must move with the times. The situation may have changed and when compared to 2011. Some of the buildings may have even been demolished. Uh, or for example, maybe uh, someone just extended the flower rack, uh, the plant rack a little. Then could it be dealt with under the Household Minor Works Validation Scheme. Just now, Mr. Chen gave you a lot of information about those schemes. Now, for the $2.9 billion over a 10-year period, uh, well, if you refer to the report, you should be able to see the breakdown figures. Uh, I, I won't take up time here. If you wish, you could. Uh, uh, we can give you the information afterwards. Okay, perhaps we now move on. 
if I could just supplement whether there would be unfairness. Well, I think the, um, the unfairness is that uh, we have a policy, but we cannot actually implement it properly, or it, there is um, a undue delay. So for law-abiding citizens, they remove their UBWs, but then there are many other UBWs that remain outstanding for more than 10 years. So instead of uh, allowing people not to abide by the law, let's, we, perhaps we could come up with a compromise. So in terms of the definition of UBWs, in terms of law enforcement, in terms of handling UBWs, we could act more quickly and we could uh, plug all the loopholes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Alan Lang, please supplement. What uh, the Vice Chairman mentioned was something of great concern to us, um, and that may be a, a unfairness, and some UBWs go unchecked in 10 years, and some law-abiding citizens remove their UBWs immediately upon notice. Uh, to me, to re report this, if raised a question, and our par paragraph 57A, we urge the Buildings Department to explore um, effective options to deal with non-compliant removal orders which are long-standing. This is our focus because there are quite a great number of reports. The policy sounds very grand, but then in actual enforcement, the situation is far from desirable. So what we want to point out is that there is a large number of long outstanding removal orders. Shouldn't you consider um, solutions? So the way it is written in the report is uh, such as adopting a fixed penalty system or granting amnesty to UBWs. Um, well, um, we haven't reached a consensus on granting amnesty within the PAC. In the hearing, the administration has um, indicated a stance, and and I agree with their stance. And if we uh, grant amnesty all of a sudden, then that would send a very strange message in the community, because members of the public would think that some UBWs are more acceptable than other. UBWs. We haven't reached a consensus on this. So looking at the context um, of this paragraph, we just said that uh, given the large number of long-standing, outstanding removal orders, you should um, explore effective means. So this is what we want to say. So I would just uh, want to clarify this. Um, let me say this again. We are not asking the administration to grant amnesty. But then in the course of the hearing, this is an idea floated for consideration by the administration. Let's move on to the next uh, report, Mr. Nguyen Singh. Government flying service are the work of the GFS. Thank you, Chairman. This is, the, has, is on the operation of the GFS. This is something of lesser concern to the public. The GFS has been providing certain services. In 1993, this, uh, there was the GFS Ordinance Cap 322. It is uh, using public money, and it has to provide flying services. Well, they have has a great number of jobs, including medical services, search and rescue, casualty evacuation, uh, casualty evacuation, firefighting, aerial surveys and even supporting the Hong Kong Police Force and other law enforcement agencies of Hong Kong in carrying out their law enforcement duties and carrying passengers as authorized by the Secretary for Security. So they have um, um, a lot of um, different services. In our report, we are concerned that starting from 2010 to 2014, um, what has happened, there are four areas of concern. One is the, the search and rescue operations. 
uh, firefighting, supporting law enforcement agencies. There are certain performance pledges to be built. There are altogether 23 performance pledges, but then um, six have not six uh, performance pledges have not been met. So this is a problem with value for money. And four targets were consistently not met for four to five years. And the PAC notes that there are different reasons um, that such targets were not met. Uncontrollable factors, such as undesirable weather conditions and air traffic control, and also other uh, factors, for example, um, change in the aircraft, maybe uh, the rescue sites are too far off and it's not uh, they're not accessible and require long uh, flying hours and also in the f in the professional field there may be special arrangements to be made so these are the special reasons uh, we note them and the PAC also urges that the GFS um, to uh, review the 23 performance targets in its uh, controlling officers reports uh, in view that there are changes in the air traffic environment service demand levels um, so the problem may be quite complicated so the GFS should consider making suitable adjustments to its performance targets so as to accurately and realistically reflect different variable factors that might affect the completion of its flying missions well, there, there is a shortage of pilots, and the PAC notes and is concerned that the GFS is um, streamlining its recruitment exercise and is uh, speeding up the training for junior staff and also uh, take on more NCSE staff who have retired. And the PAC urges uh, the administration to do two things. First, the Security Bureau should review GFS position as compared to other discipline services departments in terms of organization, manpower and remuneration structures, deployment of resources and mode of operation, so that it, it is adequately equipped with manpower and resources to effectively discharges duties in rescue and search operations. Secondly, the GFS should conduct a review on its service scope and prioritize its services in view of resource constraints. It should focus on its core businesses such as search and rescue missions and life-saving services. And also consideration may be given to outsourcing services that are less critical in nature. So these are recommendations on resources. And uh, we thank the GFS for arranging um, the committee to pay a visit to the airport and its um, headquarters. Well, I didn't participate in the visit myself. Can you talk about the purchase of the the new um, two fixed wing. wing aircrafts? Well, there has been a delay of uh, 33 months. Well, there hasn't been a problem with the procurement. There um, has been a delay of uh, 33 months, and the aircrafts are not still not delivered. So we are worried that it will ha add a heavy burden to the GFS. Um, the two aircraft should be originally commissioned in March 2013, but still they were not delivered as to of uh, today. And they said that the uh, aircraft will be commissioned by the end of this year, and which is 33 months later than the original delivery day, i.e. March 2013, as stated in the paper, to FC in 2009. The existing um, aircraft, uh, fixed-wing aircraft, has reached the, its serviceable life, which posed difficulties in maintaining their serviceability. The aircraft manufacturer said uh, that the technical support to J141 is uh, will be uh, reduced, and the total downtime of the two um, J-41s had increased and sometimes there were, well, in fact, there were two consecutive days in which both the aircraft were not serviceable. So the mission equipment installed 
on the two J41s um, comes with uh, has been much uh, restrained in the use. Mr. Mr. Kenneth Lang may be more familiar with aircraft, so can I ask him to supplement? That with regard to the delay of 33 months of these two fixed-wing aircraft, they come with. Uh, it's not that they uh, such delays with no reason. Can we can imagine? Let's turn to page uh, 67 of our report. The GFS. The. Uh, area covered by the Hong Kong Maritime Rescue Coordination Center extends to uh, an area 1,300 kilometers south of Hong Kong. So we're covering other countries, um, well, an area which is not um, covered by countries like Vietnam and so on. So um, the GFS has a lot of uh, duties very diversified. And for these two new aircrafts, they have to install uh, heavy digital aerial cameras at the bottom. Uh, so the aircrafts are heavier. And because of this, um, there are stability problems, uh, problems with vibration. So they have to ask the suppliers to redesign uh, cover so that uh, uh, the, there will be more stability in the flying. So we have to redesign this camera sliding cover and hence the delay for 33 months. This is undesirable, of course. We are concerned about it. The flying hours in the past few years, from 2010 to 2014, has increased from uh, 3,200 hours to 3,800 hours, uh, up 18%. In terms of uh, manpower, the GFF should have established establishment of 229. They now only have two, one, uh, 214 staff members. So some shifts are not uh, fully uh, manned. But then the GFS is providing 24-hour um, integrated and support services. So we are very concerned about this. Thank Mr. Leung for the education that shows he is actually an expert. Well, we don't criticize them because there's a delay of 33 months. Uh, we will try to look at it um, and find out what exactly is the reason for the delay, so we want to be fair. And then we went on the site visit, we heard their explanation. Now, it's not that we don't accept the 33 months delay, but there's a reason why there's such a delay, and that's important that we get to the facts in our value for money study. And then the GFS spent $700,000 on parts. Uh, they make prepayment before delivery. That's another important point we looked at. And then eventually the supplier uh, went out of business, but then they actually omitted to report the case. So at the end, the Hong Kong government lost about four hundred thousand dollars. We uh, on that we did criticize the GFS. We're not um, uh, biased of, in favor of the uh, GFS. Some wrote in to say that uh, uh, we were harsh with the civil aviation department, but then with the uh, government flying service, we are being lenient. No, but I think uh, where credit is due, we will give credit. But where criticism is due, we'll make criticisms as well. It's, it's all about facts, and that's important that we look at facts. Mr. Wang Yuk Man, on um, under starving problem, yeah, we went on the site visit, we listened to their briefing. I think what uh, impressed the members was the fact that there were insufficient pilots. Now here we're talking about pilots um, operating the fixed-wing aircrafts or the helicopters. So succession pl plan was a serious problem. Next to the uh, GFS space, there was a private um, plane uh, air base. And uh, they say that uh, if our staff walk over to the next door air base, they get paid twice. 
uh, flying, you know, rich people around. So that's a serious problem. There we have a shortage of pilots. Of course, in the report, we made that clear. And we hope that they would find ways to address this issue. The PAC has said that for the essential services like the rescue services, uh, they should be given top priority. Uh, before, during the colonial days, the GFS was part of the Royal uh, Air Force. Of course, it's, uh, uh, it's different. Now it's a disciplined service in terms of training, uh, in terms of uh, the guidelines they follow in uh, their operation, they do more than actually uh, just any normal discipline service. They they do the work of uh, the army actually, but then they don't have enough resources. So that's why we hope they would review the scope of service. They should give priority to search and rescue operations, for instance, because. Uh, Maybe the police may also need to uh, call in call in the uh, helicopters to help um, pursue uh, criminals, but then maybe the police should uh, do their own work. Well, the uh, government's fine service is unique in the world. If the roles they perform may be performed by several different uh, units overseas, and they, they also even perform some sort of military du uh, style duties. Let's say law enforcement um, actions in relation to threats posed by terrorists. The uh, GFS will have to help out too. They're not supposed to do it, but they have to help out. So they are um, um, actually taking on far more than they could cope. And that's why they're not able to meet the performance pledge, because they have to help fight fire, they have to help save lives, they have to do aerial surveys as well. Of course, that would. Um, uh, lead to problems in their efficiency, and so we fully appreciate the difficulties they face, and that's maybe why. That's why you say we are relatively lenient with them. Next, Ta Kung Pao. Two questions on the two new fixed-wing aircraft. Um, there were previous uh, reports for those uh, models. Actually, they they seem to have um, um, bought the wrong model. Uh, it should be aircraft for the rich. And so was there a fault committed in the procurement process? And uh, you, you talk about um, outsourcing some of the flying services. Uh, can you give some examples? Uh, do you mean they shouldn't be taking officials uh, on familiarization visits, uh, which are considered less uh, important tasks? Going back to the aircraft model, The GFS, so the model the GFS needs uh, couldn't be supplied by any single contractor all around the world because they have to save lives, they have to fire, fire they have to um, counter terrorist attack. Now, this so-called uh, aircraft for the rich uh, is because the company Bombardier supplies um, aircrafts uh, to the rich. So that's why a lot of modifications have to be done. For example, if they go on a firefighting mission, they have to refit the aircraft with um, several hundred pounds of equipment before they could fly. So um, we don't believe they have uh, bought the wrong model. I don't think that uh, accusation stands. Uh, and Paul can take the other question. Now, on outsourcing services, what kind? Uh, for example, aerial surveys. Perhaps uh, that could be taken up by private companies. And, uh, you know, ferrying um, officials or VIPs on familiarization visits. Well, we did find out about that. Um, the, the conclusion we give. We, uh, we we came to is that uh, because pilots have to clock up enough flying hours, that's a stringent requirement. So um, maybe the crews have to um, f uh, fly the craft with nobody in in it. And so sometimes if they take, say, a grassroots um, uh, people to go on um, f uh, a familiarization visit, yes, we could do it while at the same time their pilots are being trained. So we do not believe that it's abuse of the resources or their flying time, but rather it will allow them to um, do more while they have to clock up enough flying hours in any case. Other questions? 
the for the whole report, the conclusion is that they don't have enough staff, so they are not able to meet the uh, the pledge, and so you are rather understanding. But what about not being able to get the discount or they spend money without uh, getting the parts? Has that also to do with um problem of uh, not enough staff, or is it just maladministration? How come you just uh, uh, but how come you just express a concern? You don't even express disappointment. Let me explain here. We didn't use the words that you referred to because our reports are very much forward-looking. What's important is that the departments learn from their mistakes. Uh, Captain Chan admitted they have made a mistake and they have done a lot to remedy the situation. And they said that they will not repeat the mistakes again in the future. What's most important is um, the controller has uh, admitted the mistake and they are doing something to make up. So we are not blaming people just for the sake of blaming them. We want to be forward looking. We want to the um, department to be forward looking as well. Pay first and delivery later may not uh, breach the internal guidelines of uh, the government, but then the GFS is obliged to make sure that the public uh, funds are spent um, properly. And if the supplier goes bankrupt, the the GFS must do something to lessen the loss of the government. And um, they have also uh, done a review on two incidents, and they have issued internal guidelines to remind their staff that they should be stringently abiding by the relevant accounting standards and also in concluding agreements with overseas companies, measures to preventive measures should be adopted. Um, in the event that when the suppliers go bankrupt, there are uh, certain procedures to uphold the interest of the government. We do have a comment like that in our report. Following up on what Mr. Ng Lung Singh said, the PAC is not turning a blind eye to this. But you must understand that, well, what you said is right. And we, the government wants the, um, the best of both worlds from the GFS. Well, it's not that we haven't made the crit criticism on the two points you mentioned. We did make criticisms, but you have to appreciate the fact that they have to uh, operate the air fleet and they have to procure the um, the airplanes and they should uh, monitor the delivery. So their workload is really, really onerous. So I would like to take this opportunity to say that the GFS uh, are actually the four um, trade unions of the uh, GFS have submitted uh, documents to the uh, BAC telling us how they have a, um, um, a heavier workload, and they include Aircraft Technicians Union, Aircraft Engineers Association, um, Air Crewman Officers Association, and Pilots Union. And in the public hearing, we have a uh, raised uh, to the secret, 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 security bureau that these four unions have told us that they are running short of manpower, and we have um, the observation that there might uh, even be a succession problem. And the secretary for security, and also the person in charge of the GFS, have um, responded to the PAC, and they said that. Every now and then, they would review um, the remuneration package and the recruitment to, much, uh, to ensure that uh, the, the drainage of staff will be minimized. We will uh, continue to follow up, and I think it's important that the government allocate more resources to GFS. Uh, the chairman reminds me that uh, in our on-site visit to the GFS, 
Uh, we have taken a look at the operations, and in fact, we've arranged for the representatives of these um, four unions to meet with uh, PAC members, and we talk to them uh, face to face to understand their work situation. So, another question before we move on to the next uh, section, the third uh, part. I would like to add that I know that Mr. Kenneth Leung yesterday. I gave very uh, a positive comments in the form of a motion uh, at a meeting yesterday. Okay, the last question, because we have to move on to the third part. Yes, I know this. You talked about a succession problem. Can you talk further? Um, is the problem very serious? How serious is it? Um, there is an, a 16 percentage, of, a 16 percent of wastage of uh, pilots. Say, if we need 40 pilots, uh, we are having only 20 pilots. So, is that the case? Do you have uh, specific figures to share with us, Mr. Ng Lang Sing? With regard to pilots. I haven't uh, been able to retrieve the figures yet. Um, succession problem. During our visit, we looked at the work environment. We understood it from the GFS that there were experienced pilots who would uh, retire in a few years' time. A good um, manpower deployment plan will um, include a succession plan. And that means that um, the less uh, there will be experienced uh, pilots and there will be some who have who are less experienced, but then they still have certain experience. Well, we were introduced to some young pilots, and they are passionate about the work in the GFS. What I meant by having a succession problem in the GFS is that after the very experienced pilots have retired, the middle uh, ranking. Um, of pilots are in shortage. They told us that they have um, ways to deal with the problem. Let me add, in training up a pilot so that uh, he can discharge his duties, well, it takes uh, 10 years training from 2005 to 2015. Five operational pilots have left the GFS. Well, Mayron Wong about, talks about changes in the market, and among them, six of them have worked in the GFS for over 10 years, and the wastage rate is 20%. So these are the figures that I can share with you. Um, we, and, uh, and it goes to show that we understand their difficulties. Uh, in respect of how they would uh, recruit more people, uh, the Secretary for Security has recently made a proposal, that, and that is for the second generation of immigrant immigrants. Um, we encourage them to return to Hong Kong to uh, work, and we have plans to go to, say, countries in the U.S. and the U.K. to uh, recruit these uh, second generation to join the GFS. They've got female aircraft uh, maintenance staff and also female operational pilots as well. So this is one way of replenishing the manpower um, at the GFS. Let's move on to part three, and that has to do with the management of cooked food markets. Um, by the FEHD, and the lead member is Mr. Alan Ang. I will be uh, very brief here. Hong Kong is a gourmet uh, paradise, and we are very concerned about whether the uh, cooked food markets are managed properly, because it has to do with the Hong Kong's reputation as a gourmet uh, paradise. There are now 75 cooked food markets managed by the FEHD. 11 are uh, cooked food 
pocket bazaars and 30 cooked food centers. So those in the CFHB have hawker's license, and for cook CFM and CFCs, they don't have the uh, store operators don't have a hawker's license. And the cooked food markets um, are uh, separate buildings; they are not part of the public markets. But CFCs are housed within the public markets. What we are most concerned is that in the audit commission's report, it is said that. There is a high vacancy rate in the cooked food markets, CFMs, and um, some cooked food markets, uh, they are near to each other, but then only um, 10 or a dozen or so are in operation, I mean the stores in there, and the vacancy uh, rate is very high, and there have not been any um, active measures to uh, say consolidate these neighboring cooked food markets to be, create better synergy. Another uh, point of concern is that uh, whether it be the CFM, CFCs, or CFHBs, there are fire um, safety measures which are unsatisfactory, which are uh, we are very concerned about. For example, in a store, there may be uh, a dozen or so LPG um, cylinders. And well, if um, they explode, then there will be a great problem. Another concern is on the air conditioning uh, services. Well, say if we have a temperature as we ha have today, uh, if there is no air conditioning, then I don't think you would like to um, patronize a restaurant in the market. And in collecting evidence, and uh, Dr. Kwing Man uh, told us that he would uh, study on whether to improve the whether how imp the environment can be improved. If the CFCs are located on the upper floor of a public market, even if air conditioning cannot be available for the lower parts, then air conditioning can still be considered to be installed for the CFC. The last thing that I want to say is that maybe you have also noticed that the, at the LegCo, we have two subcommittees in operation. One is on the public uh, market, and the other one is on the subcommittee on hawker policy. These two subcommittees take micro perspective to uh, study public market and hawker policies and how. Um, they can better serve Hong Kong people. Whether it's hawker policy or bazaar policy or public market policy, we should take a planning perspective. If you want to organize a bazaar market or put in place a market which meets with the residents' need. You need land, right? And we um, said this to Dr. Kowing Man. We said, the, in 2012, the FSTB has identified 17 sites which could be further developed. These sites are managed by the FEHD and 12 of them are now used for cooked food um, surfaces. And five are FCFHB, two are CFM, and five are CFCs. And um, of the uh, five CFHB, three can be vacated for uh, planning by the Development Bureau and for further development. So PAC discussed with uh, Mr. Co Dr. Ko, since you have under your control so many precious plots, then that would help you in um, coming up and promoting a new hawker and public market policies, because you can have this land to be exchanged with others. Dr. Ko may not uh, 
the responding us in the terminology that we are using. He seems to be uh, using some official lines, and uh, to and he seemed to understand what we have said. So for these three public cooked food market sites, uh, they could be handed back to the government. That would be used as a lever, so to speak, to um, help um, promote his new hawker policy. Questions, please. No questions on cooked food. From Oriental Daily, Leung Ka Po. Just one question. Uh, out of the three reports, there only there's this report, there are criticisms about the um, FEHD for the lax attitude in dealing with um, the vacancy rate. So should anyone be held accountable? Well, we believe this is not something you could address overnight. In the audit report and in the PAC report, it was mentioned in 2009, report number 51 already covered these issues. Let's say there are uh, there are two cooked food markets, two, just two streets apart. Each has just eight to ten stores, and then you don't care. You just leave them as they are. Of course, it's not satisfactory. And if we say it's not desirable, now I think the controlling officer should take note. And then in report number 51 that was published in February 2009, it was pointed out that the FHD should follow up on many different issues, but then there was no follow up. Uh, for example, the rental issue, adjustments of rental, some um, rentals in the arrears, or government rates are not recovered, and so on. So they haven't done all these uh, since then, and we have asked them to um, try to take actions. Because uh, we will follow up on uh, our recommendations in the report until they are all complied with. So we won't let them off the hook. If they don't comply, we will pursue them. So they, we, they're not allowed to cut any slack. Paul? I think in many members' um, comments, we said that uh, now um, with the value for money study, we want to make sure they use uh, resources properly. But at the same time, uh, we have to look at um, those operators of uh, cooked food markets and so on. They have they are just struggling to make ends meet, so we have to put people first when we deal with these cases. And so we appreciate that uh, the department faces certain difficulties. On the one hand, it's supposed to uh, comply with the rules and regulations, but maybe we don't want to put too much pressure to bear on the operators. Well, maybe what they're doing is not uh, desirable, but then we won't be too strong in our condemnation, if I could put it that way. There are 27 markets. Only and only 22 markets are air-conditioned, and that's not desirable. But then sometimes there may be um, some constraints. So, uh, for example, not enough electricity supply, so air conditioning could not be retrofitted. But then uh, it, may, it may be the case that um, there is a need for such a market in the area. So that's why some of these markets remain, although they're not air conditioned, they're still there to serve the residents in the neighborhood. So they face a lot of difficulties in running these markets, and then they have limited resources too. And they can't do away with some of these markets. So that's why we've uh, asked Dr. Ko Wing Man to consider a new strategy to deal with um, markets, public markets, as well as cooked food um, centers as a whole. Then it will be good for the uh, hawkers and for the local communities too. And we've actually encouraged Dr. Ko to buy back the licenses from some of the uh, hawkers. So hawkers don't have to struggle 
to run a business in such poor conditions. So you can see in our report, we th believe uh, we should put people first and and see how we could address these issues. Now, some of the markets are ne needed by the residents. We don't want to um, demolish all the markets so everything is run by link rate. Of course, we don't want that. So it's about striking the uh, the right balance, and we have to identify what is the right balance? And so we urge uh, Dr. Ko Wingman to to uh, put people first in serving the people. Well, we, uh, Dr. Ko has been active in the work uh, in the meetings of the subcommittee on issues relating to public markets and the subcommittee of hawker policy of the LegCo. Uh, recently, at the uh, Subcommittee on public markets meeting, he said that rent would be frozen till the end of this year, but it will be extended to the 30th of June 2017. And then he went through the consultancy report with us uh, two or three times. So maybe your observation is right. Our inclination is to encourage the secretary to be more proactive in doing better so everybody could benefit. That's uh, generally the direction we take. No other questions? Uh, just a straightforward question. Now, you said you could appreciate the difficulties the government face in dealing with markets, but from report number 51, those issues remain outstanding, and now we see new issues. Is it the case that when it comes to the management of public markets, there are a lot of loopholes? What explanations do they give? How come they could allow so many loopholes to be left unplugged, and do you accept their explanations? If you ask me, of course, uh, that's not acceptable. But while we do not accept explanations, we have to understand what the problems are. Now, if you go back to report number 51, you know, some of the hawkers simply could not pay up the rent. If you force them, they would just go bankrupt. And sometimes they can't pay the electricity bill. It's not that they don't want to do it, but they uh, they face constraints, and maybe they have to end up using more resources in recovering um, the um, payment in arrears. Well, this is available for money study, so they have to explain to us why they couldn't do something that we have uh, specified in our report. But here we are talking about serving the public. That's what they're trying to do. If you try to measure everything with money, well, sometimes it's hard to measure service with money. Uh, uh, that is how much we should recover in running a market. We can't just look at everything from the commercial point of view. Sometimes we have to look at it uh, as a service to the public. So what they can't, what they don't um, achieve it, under report f number 51, we'll tell them to review, or uh, they could say uh, we will waive all these fees so they just write off the debt. Or, 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 of course, if they, there's still such payment in, uh, outstanding, we have to keep asking them what they're doing about it. And you see most of these are just um, um, individual hawkers who um, fail to pay the electricity bill or government rates and so on. Mr. M well, I think our PC reports are becoming um, m more... Um, more um, mature in a way. We try to, uh, that is, we are able to strike the right balance. Now, we know what the actual situation is, and we know sometimes the government may have difficulties doing certain things, but that doesn't mean we'll just let them off. Uh, it's not about um, just sympathizing with the hawkers. We, as you, in our report, uh, we said, we we've, uh, note the secretary's um, explanations. Now, cooked food hawker bazaar should be transient in nature. It's for reciting uh, licensed hawkers, and these uh, bazaars will eventually be closed. So that is uh, the reality. And this is just a transitional arrangement, and so we have to take care of both sides. The government has to take certain actions at the same time. Um, after they recover all the licenses, they have to redevelop those sites. And the Development Bureau uh, would also de redevelop those sites uh, at an appropriate time. So it's about um, using public money properly. That's why I say this is a mature report, is in that sense. Mr. Alan Leung, the lead member, could uh, give you the current picture. 
Now, I joined Leshko in 2004. Since then, I've been following up on the question of public markets, uh, especially in relation to rentals, ritual fitting of air conditioning, and so on. And as you know, the government has commissioned an uh, expert uh, co committee on public markets and the reports been published and then this was discussed by the subcommittee on public markets and uh, Dr. Cole heard us loud and clear he is going to freeze rain for another 18 months till the 30th of June 2017 we believe that's good because first of all they must improve the business environment for the store operators they must given they must be given a chance to make some money before you increase the rent otherwise like if they do like what they did 3 years ago to increase rent people would just um, leave so we would like to give some more leeway to the Dr. Co to deal with the issues and we'll follow up on these matters at the reference subcommittees or the panel. Now here we look at the issue from the point of view of value for money. And um, in measuring value for money, it must be fair and impartial. And we need to strike the right balance in dealing with issues. So that's why if you look at all three reports, where criticisms are due, we'll make criticisms, and where um, credit is due, we'll give credit. And we try to look at things from the point of view of the public as we review the audit report, and then we try to uh, get to the real reasons for those problems. Thank you.